Today we're going to be looking at passive accessory mobility or arthrokinematic assessment of the knee. Now for this we're going to look at a couple different uh, components. Uh, first we'll look at uh, anterior and posterior glide of the tibia on the femur and then we'll also look at a distraction technique in a more prone position. So to begin with, uh, hopefully you've already completed uh, kind of the entry portion of the exam. Uh, you've assessed palpation and range of motion, uh, assessed the quality of their symptoms and any provocation uh, factors. Now you're ready to begin your more hands-on manual assessment. At this point, uh, you have a couple options. Uh, you can use a bolster or a foam roll to put the knee in more of an open pack position. Uh, that typically works well to assess those arthrokinematics. Uh, and then you can also have the individual in different positions, and we'll talk about those as we go. To begin with, we're going to take our bolster, we're going to slide it just at the distal portion of the femur on both sides. Uh, and both sides is important because your reference is going to come from their uninvolved side. So in this case, if we imagine that their pathology was on their right knee, we would assess the left knee first to look for their normal, and then we would go to the right and do a side-to-side -side comparison. For now, we're in about an open pack position. Uh, open pack position is mid-range for the knee and exists somewhere around 30 to 60 degrees. Uh, we're around 30 right now, so this is okay. We can also take them up a little bit higher, and I'll demonstrate that in just a moment. But specifically, what we're gonna look at is we're going to look at a posterior glide of the tibia on the femur, keeping in mind that the tibia is a more concave surface, and the distal femur, that being the trochlea, is more of our convex surface. So to begin with, your mo or excuse me, your stabilizing hand is going to provide a slight compressive force into the bolster to stabilize the femur. Your mobilizing hand is going to be opposite, and it's going to be fairly close to the joint line. Do be mindful of line of force. Because of the position of the knee, it's not a straight vertical assessment, but there's a slight angulation so that you stay perpendicular to the tibia. So at this point, we're going to stabilize. We're going to bring our hand right distal to the joint line. Be mindful of that perpendicular orientation of force. And then my left hand is going to be my mobilizing or assessing hand. We're going to take up the slack and assess the amount of posterior glide of the tibia on the femur, as well as the quality of symptoms that our patient is complaining of. We can do that two to three times. Once we eclipse three times, though, we are beginning to almost treat the joint with successive uh, repetitions. Uh, so this would be in about that 30 degree position. We can then also go higher, so we're going to remove the bolster at this point. We're going to come up closer to somewhere between 60 to 90 degrees. Now at this point, the benefit is you can assess not only anterior, but also posterior glide. So just for your visual ability, we're going to set the right side down, still assuming that's kind of our side of pathology. So at this point, you can come in and actually sit on the foot to stabilize. And then you can use a, a thumb to thumb or kind of an interlocking approach. To again come right here, you no longer need to stabilize the femur because you're actually going to be pushing really uh, straight into the shaft of the femur almost. And you can assess that posterior glide as well. Uh, probably need a little bit higher line of force there, but uh, stabilize the foot. You then can conversely assess anterior glide of the tibia on the femur in the same position. For this, you're going to come into kind of that posterior joint space of the popliteal fossa, and you're going to pull out towards you. And it's really not so much that your biceps and your arms are doing the work as it is your trunk is doing the work. You're kind of leaning back and assessing that. Many clinicians will leave their thumbs resting kind of right on either side of the patellar tendon, right on the tibial plateau, such that they can feel, they can palpate the degree of translation that's occurring and to look for that excess translation of the tibial plateau on the distal femur. Keeping in mind, the, the two main structures that are going to be kind of checking this motion would be the ACL, anterior cruciate ligament, 
uh, checking anterior glide, as well as the capsule and, and also some of our, our hamstring as well. If we're into that uh, open back position that you saw just a moment ago, we were doing the posterior glide. There we're looking at PCL, as well as some other static restraints uh, as well. So you can assess in that position or here for your anterior or posterior glide. The other uh, assessment that we want to make is tibiofemoral distraction. Now it's pretty hard to do that in this position, so we're going to have our patient flip into a prone position. And again, so you can visualize this, I'm now going to switch to the right side. If we were assessing the left side, we would need to come around just so that we stay on the same side. But, uh, in order for you to be able to see it, we'll switch legs here. For tibiofemoral distraction, we're going to bend the individual's knee to approximately 90 degrees. Now again, at this point, we need to assess and ensure that there aren't any other kind of uh, sequelae or, or factors that could kind of compromise this, because this is a fair amount of force that we're going to be placing uh, through the structures. We need to stabilize our femur, and so how that looks is we oftentimes will bring our leg in contact with theirs. So you can imagine if somebody's been having issues with the hamstrings, uh, they're having symptoms of sciatica or something along those lines, that can be a fairly provocative position. So be mindful of that. Once we stabilize here, we're going to take our hands and we're going to interlock them just proximal to the medial and lateral malleolus. That's position one. Okay, I'll show you position two in just a moment. Also, we flex our other leg. So in this case, that's my stance leg on the left-hand side. Interlock our hands, and then we're going to stand up with our left leg, in this case, our stance leg. And what that does is it provides a distraction for us at the knee. Right? Somebody that has, for example, uh, an osteochondritis desiccans, a loose body, maybe even a, a meniscal tear or something along those lines, may benefit from a little bit of distraction to see if there is an alleviation of symptoms. We can also provide a little bit of compression in the same position to see if that provokes symptoms back and forth. Now, if you are a little bit smaller framed or your hands are a little bit smaller, you may find it challenging to get your hands all the way around someone's uh, distal shank around their ankle. And so another strategy is that you would actually come a little bit lower and you could put their leg in contact with your shoulder and wrap your arm around. Or uh, instead of using kind of a two-armed approach, you could just wrap one arm around and stabilize with the other as such. Okay, if I wrap this arm around here, I stabilize here, now I can kind of get a hold of the calcaneus and I can also provide that distraction force it's probably not going to be quite as much in terms of overall force just because of your mechanics and the fact that you're using one arm as opposed to two, but it is a secondary or alternative uh, way in which to get that assessment. So, give a go uh, of these techniques, looking at anterior, posterior, and tibiofemoral distraction of the knee. And let me know if there's any questions.